So I just want to welcome everyone to the Young Achievers podcast. I'm thrilled to be your host for today's engaging event at Lancaster Gate. So in our upcoming episode, we'll be featuring insightful interviews from the nominees of the prestigious Young Achievers Award. So join me, Isra Johnson, a 2023 Young Achievers awardee and a final year student at the University of Warwick, as we delve into the inspiring stories of some of these exceptional individuals. So for over 12 years, UPF's Young Achievers Award has celebrated the outstanding works of, this, of individuals, shining a spotlight on the incredible contributions they've made to society. Ahead of the parliamentary event, this podcast serves as a platform to delve into the nominees' commendable work they have done for the community, for charity, and humanitarian work. So during the podcast, we'll explore their motivations, challenges they've faced, and reflect back on key achievements they have done. We're also eager to hear about their future plans and potential collaborations with UPF also. But this isn't just a one-sided conversation. We encourage you guys, the audience, to actively participate in this podcast also. We'll be having a question and answer section at the end as well. So join me as what promises to be an engaging and motivational experience. Okay, so today we're joined by Tariq Brown, a resilient individual who has turned failure into, into direction. Tariq shares insights on guiding young minds, the importance of stepping outside of comfort zone and maximizing university experience. So I'm eager to hear about your story. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you for the intro and thank you everyone else for coming and allowing me to speak to you guys today. Um, yeah, I, I think when Margaret was briefing me about opportunity, I thought about where I can start uh, my journey and, and give you insight into me and my experience. So I'll start first of all with my first ever university choice, which was Loughborough University. So year 13, um, I'm trying to decide what degree I can see myself working in. Um, where do I see myself, you know, getting up every day and feeling purposeful, feeling like I can wake up and, and go to work. And I naturally chose what I was good at rather than what I wanted to be good at. And for me, that was the first mistake in my university journey. So I made my way to Loughborough University. Um, I was the first person from my school to go to Loughborough University as well. Um, and I was also coming from a whole academy head boy position. So naturally, I felt like I was prepared to enter an environment where excellence was the standard. Again, I was, um, yeah, humbly, um, what's the word? I had a realization, basically. Um, and when I got there, I was very, very much out of my depth. For those of you that go to university, the institution is very, very large in comparison to sixth form or college. Uh, and that was something that, yeah, shook me up a little bit. And I actually managed to fell my first year at university. Um, and hence why Israel said that failure was a redirection for me. Um, because what it allowed me to do was understand myself a lot better, um, to reevaluate where I want to go in my life and my future. And I naturally found myself transitioning to Sussex University. So that was the start of my journey, I would say. Um, you know, understanding that my friends are going to have a different journey. A lot of them were going to JP Morgan's, EYs. And I was like, okay, cool. I need to do something. I need to catch up. Um, and yeah. Sorry, I just, yeah, wanted, sorry. I just wanted to touch on that. So you mm -hmm. talk about how, you know, during that moment, I'm guessing it must have been quite hard on you to process all of that to say, oh, you're going to fail and accepting that. What did you think about you or what experiences did you think you had that allowed you to overcome that? Because I think many people, they don't know how to cope well with failures of that extent. I think it, for me, it was the, the people that I had around me um, and especially with the community that I work with now, just simple things that we take for granted, such as support, encouragement, just listening. Um, that I was fortunate to have that network around me that could help me to do that. So um, it was my dad that was telling me a lot that failure is redirection. You know, don't let it define you. It's just one moment in your life. And from that and constantly trying to affirm myself in that belief, I managed to clear my head enough to, you know, think about going back to university, which a lot of people, once they fall out of the system, they're maybe a bit put off by, by failure. So, um, yeah, as I said, I found my way at Sussex and, and that was the best thing for me. I wanted to be closer to home. 
Uh, I grew up in Croydon, so it's, it's not too far. Um, so yeah, gr growing up in Croydon, I wanted to be closer to home and take that pressure off myself. And naturally I did that. And it was only until my second year that I, I got my first opportunity, which I felt really was the trajectory that I wanted to go separate from my peers. So in my second year, I managed to get an internship in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Um, yeah, so it was, a, it was a great opportunity. I stayed there for about a month uh, and a bit, just going on a business rotation, understanding Malaysian culture, understanding um, the international business environment. And it was a life-changing experience for me. So when I returned, I wanted to continue that and immerse myself in, in that global environment. I managed to get another internship for my placement year in Malta. So I stayed in Malta for about six months as a financial recruiter for um, financial services company, Devere Group. <clears throat> so they focus on high net worth clients, um, helping them with their finances to save, to invest for short and long term. That was an amazing experience. I mean, I've, I've been recycling that word, but um, a lot of my, my career journey has been character development as well, which I encourage a lot of young people to seek as well as educational attainment. Um, so yeah, coming into February 2023, uh, I was lucky enough again to be personally recognized by the CEO at the company and was promoted to their Abu Dhabi office. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I made How my... did that make you feel? That? That's yeah. incredible. <laughs> um, it's surreal because he offered me the opportunity on the Friday and I had to make a decision then, there and then. And it was another thought process of me leaving my family um, leaving Western culture as well. I, I believe that, you know, every country in Europe is different, but Western culture is an underlying theme. And knowing that I'd have to leave Europe and go to the Middle East, um, being a black man as well, um, you know, not sure if there's going to be people that look like me. I wanted to take that leap. I wanted to be different. I wanted to be unique. And th that was the first thoughts that came to my head during that offer in the first few seconds, honestly. So I just said yes straight away. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Um, so yeah, that he, when I say he offered it on Friday, mm -hmm. by the time I came back on Monday to work, he had already booked a flight for me to be there for on Friday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I was saying this on the Zoom yesterday, like finding a property in another country is one of the toughest things that you can do. Um, the UK does very well with their, even though the house prices are up there. Um, yeah, finding a property in Malta, you know, settling into life, you know, understanding what they value and how they live their life. It was a great experience. And um, yeah, it was sad. I was sad to leave. But again, going to Abu Dhabi was an amazing experience. And I found myself in the office in, in the same week. So oh, Incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, just moving on from, from that, a lot of that was speaking to high net worth clients. So I managed to speak to clients from like Saudi Arabia, uh, Bahrain, uh, Oman, getting on the phone and, and trying to negotiate with clients to invest in our products and services. And that just taught me a lot about communication, taught me a lot about you know how I can appeal to those values and make a sell and build trust in relationships with international clients. So that was, um, yeah, I'd done that till about July 2023 and then I came home yeah. Oh, wow. yeah so you did a placement year for that then so that was a placement year yeah. uh, did yeah. you did you have any I guess questions about doing a placement year because you'd be away from friends and family for quite a while wouldn't it? what before I went yeah whilst you were on placement year yeah it was it was very hard I said to I said to people a lot that I felt like I was stuck in this gray area where I was separated from the UK culture, that things move so fast here. So naturally you're hearing things in the news, which is already secondary information. But then I'm also not a part of Maltese culture or um, culture in the UAE. But it was fortunate for me being someone who is quite curious to actually observe a society um, from the outside. Like that was an amazing experience. And, you know, growing up in Croydon and growing up in London, actually, you believe that the way that life is in London is the way that life is across the world. Yeah. So I felt like I had been lied to, especially in Malaysia, because my opinions on Southeast Asian culture, Middle Eastern culture was developed through 
Western UK media. So it was only until I got that, got out there and experienced that for myself that I was able to be like, okay, cool. I need to do more things for myself and develop my own perspectives and opinions. So it came to me re reprogramming myself and wanting to do that for others. And, and hence why what I am now is a, a careers officer for African Caribbean society at my university. So trying to put students from my community who you know look like me and had similar experiences you know, how can I put them in positions to do what I've done and better? Um, and I felt like I could do that through becoming a careers officer. Yeah. Um, yeah, helping. So uh, I think I'll, I'll get onto that. Uh, with my careers officer role, a lot of it is one-to-one -one mentorship, checking people's CVs, the, the, the kind of mundane career development stuff. Um, but I like to involve personal development in my services. So I've hold, hosted workshops on net, the principles of networking, um, public speaking, developing confidence. You know, when you get the job, that's the first step. You know, how can you thrive in the job as well? So what type of skills can we learn? So a lot of those conversations were with young people who had certain questions about what corporate culture was. I now have been fortunate to set up three corporate partnerships with my ACS, with 10,000 Black interns, at SEO London, um, girls are investors too and trying to set up as many events as possible to advance people's um, career development so that's been an amazing experience because I always say helping people is fulfilling for me um, but it also helps me too because you know the advice that I'm giving out I have to really understand myself to be able to give authentic advice which is something that I pride myself on so yeah a, a lot of it was coming back from Abu Dhabi I was like I don't want to just come back into uni and you know the change would be so contrasting so a careers officer would keep me busy i'm also a cultural leader as well so cultural leader for an organization called poetic unity so they use poetry and spoken word for young people to support them with their mental health so we do workshops events um, to basically show young people that they can use creative expression to understand the world around them but also there's not going to always be a time where you're going to have someone to talk to so developing someone's creative expression will allow them to talk to themselves mm -hmm. through poetry and spoken word and it's not always as easy as you know journaling sometimes it can be too real for people so through yeah because you, yeah. you mentioned that in um, the zoom call earlier and I think I was just quite curious how did you even get into poetry to begin with oh <laughs> well, I've always, I, I love philosophy, like I'm a big philosophy lover. Um, I actually have a blog on philosophy and um, geopolitics, I will plug myself <laughs> in. Um, but I've always been someone who's quite curious and uses my imagination a lot, whether it be in my course or be with communicating with someone, I'm always using my imagination. So I actually started writing. I wrote for somebody else who had gone through something and I said, I would love to write about your experience. Once I got their consent, I wrote um, just a, a poem about, you know, their experience and um, it kind of blossomed from there. So, yeah, it, it was obviously I do finance and business. So, yeah, <laughs> when I tell people that I do poetry, it's like, oh, okay. Um, but I was for, I always say I was fortunate to discover poetry because there's a lot of misconceptions about what it is. Shakespeare, Lord Byron, you know, that's the conventional stuff. But when you show people that you have freedom in creativity, it allows people to liberate themselves and being able to witness that, to see young people, you know, sit down and write something that means something to them, but they enjoy reading it out as well. It's a very, very powerful tool. So I've been fortunate to collaborate with um, Penguin Publishers, going into um, their office and, and helping young people, sixth form students, as well as um, Save the Children, um, poems for Transport for London as well. So a lot of campaigns that were using creative expression to get, a fr um, get across our messages about society, a lot's going on at the moment. Um, the event with Save the Children the other day was about what's going on in the Middle East at the moment. Um, so yeah, just being able to 
try and deliver impact in my way, again, I always say it's a privilege. There's a lot of people that work just as hard as me and won't have those opportunities. So I always say that I lead with gratitude first and foremost. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, I think that deserves a round of applause, honestly. <laughs> So, yeah, I think working with the community has always been something that I've loved to do. I've been doing it for about seven years now. I'm 24, so I've been doing it since 18. I started as a National Citizen Service NCS mentor. So that's a four-week residential program where you take 12 young people across the country and you develop their interpersonal and professional skills. I've done that for a few years and then worked as a play scheme worker, um, working with young people who of a range of different abilities, especially uh, SEN, so special education needs, learning how to communicate, learning a, a little bit of sign language. I'm a bit too rusty right at the moment. Um, but that taught me a lot about being able to communicate with young people in a different way and actually prepared me for going abroad. Because when you're communicating with someone, it makes it easier when you use your hands and you like use your body language to communicate as well. So it's funny how things go full circle where you help people and then it starts to help you, um, as I was saying before. So done that for a few years, but now it's about me branching into thought leadership, you know, encouraging young people, not giving them advice, but inspiring thought leadership within them so that they can, you know, look at the world and discern information for themselves. And hence why I'm doing a blog. Um, I'm also writing a book as well. Um, it's not finished, so please. Um, but I'm writing a book as well. And yeah, just my, I think my role is breaking down information that's complex and providing it in a palatable way so that young people can think for themselves. Because we live in an area of, um, or an era of information, but misinformation is also present. So how are you going to help young people get rid of those misconceptions that international opportunities are not for them or these sort of um, industries are not for them is through providing information that they can think for themselves. So yeah, that's that's pretty much my journey in a nutshell. I'll try to summarize in the quickest possible. No, that was honestly so amazing. I think you definitely have a unique experience. I think not a lot of people can attest to. You know, because for example, like when you travel to all these different countries, I think I'd love to visit some of the places you've been. It sounds amazing. But in terms of traveling internationally and being in these different countries and different regions, that is so completely different to home. I guess. Um, mm -hmm. How was there any experiences that I guess pushed you beyond your limit and really contributed to your personal professional growth there there wasn't any specific experiences that pushed me or challenged me I would say it's always the the candid days like a random day in April where you're just going home and you've you know you just miss things that are comfortable just the small things you know being able to go home and see your siblings or go home and just give your mom or dad a hug you know these things are very very small but when you leave, it's the things that you crave the most because everything is new, everything's exciting. And I always say to young people that are looking to go abroad, and you know, it sounds very exciting when I explain my experience, but it, there's a difference between going on holiday and traveling. Um, you know, traveling is way more difficult. You have to immerse yourself in the culture or you're gonna be lonely. And you have to be willing to move your perspectives of the world aside and not judge them from your own mm -hmm. reference point. And that's where I feel like a lot of people go wrong. They'll be comparing Malaysian culture to UK culture or the Middle East to Southeast Asian just because there's similarities or just because it makes them feel comfortable with the differences. So I always say there's a, a mental process that you have to go through before you consider taking an international opportunity. And, and that's the biggest challenge that I would say that I had was remove them my perspective of what things are yeah yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's very true mm. yeah because um i grew up in nigeria and i think coming to the uk mm. it's always always such a culture shock and you have expectations of what you think it will be like but in the reality it doesn't always i guess reflect your expectations exactly so it's about having to compartmentalize that and actually understand okay yeah. this is what it is mm. and accept it i think that's true very mm. true for sure 
And, you know, so university is usually a hub for opportunities and experiences. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, a lot of university students out there are probably wondering, how do I land internships and opportunities that mm -hmm. you have? How do you think you've maximized the opportunities available to you to be able to access some of these opportunities that others haven't been able to? Okay, I'm trying to think of which one was sure the best one. Okay, so I initially thought that I would scour the internet to find opportunities and that can be a very mundane task until I found the most simple answer, which is, like I was saying before, we go to a very large institution that has seen thousands of students pass through. So naturally, there's thousands of connections that they've developed, thousands of opportunities that they've also seen pass through, go through their admin and what they've had to process. So I would say for young people, it's like, or young students that are in university, tapping into the, um, the institution that you're already in. Because a lot of young people don't know that um, the university offers, you know, summer, summer school programs, different initiatives that's going to, you know, advance you in your career and your educational attainment. And it can be intimidating trying to speak to your institution. Like I said, you're coming from a background which is much more localized. Teachers, have a, you have a better connection with teachers. But it was me, you know, using the career services. When I started to use that and have appointments with career advisors, they would point me in the right direction. Um, and one of the, the best pieces of advice I got at a networking event was conversations um, save you time. And the reason being is because you don't have to experience some of the obstacles that they have when you go out and have conversations with either the careers advisor or you go to a networking event, you know, save these, save what they're saying and apply it to your journey constantly, like refine yourself. And you can do that by using the resources that are at university. And then when you go out there, I feel like you'll be better prepared to capitalize on opportunities because opportunities are finite they're finite and you, you want to make sure that the job that you want you want to be ready to go into that interview and have no regrets when you come out and I find the best way to do that is to use that low stakes situation of speaking to the staff members that are already at your university I'd say yeah. Yeah. I think what I find particularly fascinating about your story is that you know you had all of this support and you know opportunities while you're in university but you didn't just stop it there. You actually wanted to give some forward as well through your role within the ACS as a careers, careers officer. Officer, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think for me that's something that's really amazing. So you wanted to play a pivotal role in other people's future as well. Um, do you have any strategies or any advice that you often give out to um, students as well to make the most of the opportunities and help them in their growth? Um. Similar to what I said in terms of conversation save you weeks. Be willing to have a conversation with anyone. Mm. You, you, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover. You can only get so much from the first impression. First impressions, um, they're important. But, you know, really try and ask that person the right questions. I use LinkedIn a lot. Um, I, ah, I love it. Yeah, you'll see, <laughs> me, you'll see me at a networking event. I'll be taking pictures and, and doing everything. Um, why? because you attract the people that you need. Um, I have two mentors. Um, I pay for my mentors as well, I pay for their time. Because like I said, they've gone through what I've gone through and they've completed their career. So I can ask them questions, not so much about you know, what made you successful. You can stand out even in asking questions. You know, what, where did you go wrong is a perfect question. Why? Because most successful people it's almost become habitual when people ask them questions. You'd be like, oh, how did you do this? That they could just answer straight away. But I know that I'm going to stick out to this successful per uh, person if I make them think. So I know that I'm going to make you think by saying, where did you go wrong? You're not expecting that question from me. So even when you go to networking events, you may not feel like you have value to offer because you don't have an experience, but you can offer value by you know, allowing that person that you're speaking to, to think. Um, so that's what a, a piece of advice that I would say networking is, is so, so important. And before you start your career, understand yourself. 
um, as cliche as it sounds, you need to know what makes you tick. You need to know what your strengths are, what your attributes are, how you can leverage opportunities, how you can maximize resources. And you're only going to do that by having a good understanding of who you are and what you want, because then you can just be going into situations with no direction. So the the best way to find that direction is through understanding yourself, I'd say. Yeah. No, I think that's a brilliant answer. Thank Thank that's fantastic. Like I said earlier, this isn't just going to be a one-to-one conversation. I know it's going to get quite boring if it's just us talking to each other. So I wanted to, you know, bring it to the audience. Do you guys have any question you want to ask them? Sorry. Yeah. I'm going to put this right back to you. Mm. Where did you go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> um. I think I went wrong in the initial journey of like comparison. So I knew that corporate industries weren't for me. The JPs, the EYs, all of these um, industries or companies that have this reputation. And it's, I spent a lot of time, you know, thinking that I wasn't good enough because I didn't have these sort of opportunities to validate my value. So I would say focus on your own journey use people as a benchmark rather than a comparison. And there is a, it's a fine line, but it's, it, there's a difference because when you use them as a benchmark, it helps to frame your ambition. It helps to mold where you want to go. But if, you, if you're starting to compare yourself to that person, then anything that you have um, before you get to that level is not good enough. And then you, won't, you no longer enjoy the journey. The journey is now just a means to an end. So I would say use people as a benchmark rather than a comparison yeah that's what i did yeah thank you yeah that was beautiful yeah, always bro i'm used to this more i'm very concerned about communities today young people today especially i wouldn't want to be a young person today that's for certain <laughs> um you know i'm a working class boy so i understand working class values at the same time what are the skills, what are the things that will help people like yourselves, but all the young communities as well? Because what I see at the moment is separation. I don't see uh, people coming together. Um, and I think Great Britain is a society that should value all communities, all perspectives. But what do you think is necessary now to actually bring um, businesses like yours, the young people that you're mentoring at the moment, what help do they need? But how on earth, is, at the same time, can we actually create a society that will support all businesses, all communities, and come together as Great Britain again? That's a, that's a good question. And um, I would say when I've worked with the organization that I do now, Poetic Unity, we worked with um, Mission 44, which is Lewis Hamilton's um, innovative uh, think tank organization. And I would say when I go to events where it's about diversity and inclusion and equality, a lot of the time we want to bring more people in the room, but we won't actually understand the value of having them in the room. So it just becomes tokenism. And I feel like that's where a lot of corporate companies go wrong, where, yeah, they maybe want to get um, people of ethnic minorities um, into the office, but you don't understand, you know, what is it, what's the value of having an inclusive society? Because it seems like there's only pressure, because there's pressure from the people, that's the only reason why things are changing. It should be a thing of, I want an inclusive society because I understand the value of having someone from Jamaica in the room or someone from Vietnam in the room. Why? Because their cultural understanding is going to allow you to be innovative. It's going to allow your employees to learn. It's going to allow your product right, product um, range to expand. And these things, I don't feel like they're pushed. So in terms of that cultural value, I feel like there's a discrepancy there. And... Um, in terms of bringing people together, having more grace for cultural understanding, similar to what I said when I went abroad, judging people from my reference point. We need to separate ourselves from what we know and just be open to understanding. We don't actually have to get it. We don't actually have to agree. But we provide that space where everyone can feel comfortable to present their opinions and they feel respected and they feel like um, 
yeah, that feel like they're valued, I think is an important thing. And, and lastly, touching on young people specifically, I think young people now, I think they're much more capable than people think. I feel like the, the, the social media part of it is hard because people are connecting online and you can't replace um, face-to-face contact. You can't replace that. But at the same time, they're much more socially conscious. You know, seeing what's going on in the world, everyone can is broadcasted these things. And young people seem to be very receptive to advocacy and, you know, putting forward what is right, which I think is important. Now it's just about them being nurtured. And that's where I say adults go wrong, where adults forget that they were children as well. Adults forget that they were teenagers as well. And, and that the pressures of being a teenager are, are going to be different to them as an adult, but we still must appreciate them. Um, we still, still must give young people their respect. So I think it's just very, very simple seeing people as individuals and, and respecting you know, their, their value, I would say. Can we give a round of applause for Terry, please? Thank you. Thank you, bro. Yeah.